City Lit, we are proud to bring people together to enrich lives through learning. From languages to performing arts, business to humanities, visual arts to well-being, deaf education and speech therapy. City Lit, follow your passion. Great. Welcome, everybody. Um, my name's Mark Malcolmson. I have the huge honour and privilege of being the principal at City Lit. And I'd like to welcome you to one of our occasional series of In Conversations. Um, these used to take place physically in the college um, and we used to be in our hall and we'd have our guests in and have a chat. Um, one of the disadvantages and therefore the advantages of the pandemic has meant that we've moved these online, which means that we've been able to reach out to more people. Given that our capacity in the hall is 100, we, we well exceed that on many occasions. So that's that's been a positive. And it also means we've been able to access people who are tremendously busy, um, who are then able to come and spend an hour with us either at lunchtime or an early evening and to talk about either a particular issue, a book that they've just produced, um, or ideas that they have. And um, so as I said, it's been an occasional series and I'd like to welcome everybody who's kind of joining us today. Um, I am genuinely delighted to welcome John T. Claypole, who is Director of Arts at the BBC and I equally as importantly, a former City Lit student. Um, John T is joining us from, from his home and um, we have the wonderful Charmaine who is going to be interpreting for us. And we have Julie who is doing um, speech to text closed captioning. So for any of you who want the speech to text at the bottom of the screen, if you go at the bottom of your um, Zoom connection, and click on closed captions, then you should be able to get that coming through to you there. Um, the way we're going to operate for the next 50 minutes or so is we're going to discuss Jonty's new book. Um, I'm going to ask him a series of questions. Um, for given that we've got so many people joining us, we're not able to actually ask, let you join in verbally because the background noise is too large, and we found that in previous events. So what, if you have a question, what I'd like you to do is click on the Q&A box, the Q&A box rather than the chat box, if possible, so we're not having dueling screens going on. Um, and then what I will do is I will keep an eye on the Q&A box um, and have a look at questions that are coming through. And as I see them, I will try and do my best to either weave them in or ask them very specifically. Um, so. That's, that's the way if you have something particular that you want to ask or something that comes up or you want clarification, I'll, I'll keep an eye on the Q&A box. Could I ask one favour, because we found this in, in previous um, conversations, is that when you're sending questions, could they be quite concise? It's actually quite hard, I have to admit, to keep the conversation going and then trying to read down very long um, questions. So if they could be kept um, punchy and concise, that would really help me in terms of my um, moderating for the next um, hour. But without further ado, because actually what you're here to see here is, is jaunty rather than me, um, is we're here to talk about this. Um, John T's new book published by Welcome. Um, it's called Words Fail Us in Defense of Disfluency. Um, I have to say, uh, I finished it at 20 to 9 this morning. Um, it's a tremendous book. It's um, I was I was talking to John T just previously, and then I, we I was trying to say it's it's interesting how it's part science, it's part social commentary, it's part personal memoir, it's part biography of people from the sector and um, it's it's absolutely brilliant in the way that it weaves all of those different elements together. Um, for those of you, lots of you who are on here know our um, speech therapy unit at City Lit. It is nationally famous and actually arguably world famous. We have an amazing set of colleagues who work with adults um, with disfluency issues and they have been supporting people at the college for well over 40 years in terms of their, um, their fluency. And um, I'd like to pay tribute to those. And I think John T is going to talk about his City Lit experience a little bit. Um, 
I know in the audience here, we have one of our most famous um, alumni of this area, Ed Balls, who has previously been in the college a number of times talking about um, his stammer and also the support he got at the college. And we, we are hugely kind of honored by having Ed as one of our fellows and part of our City Lit community. And um, John T kind of adds to that for us. So John T, thank you, kind of welcome. And really, really pleased to kind of host you back at City Lit, even if it's only virtually. Um, could we start with um, your story? Um, you, you talk, not overly about yourself, but you're, you basically bring your story into the narrative in the book. So for, for everybody, could you kind of talk about your, your history here? Yeah, and I mean, first of all, good afternoon, everyone. It's very weird uh, talking and not being able to see who, are, who are, I'm talking to, but um, uh, hello, and it's very nice to see a list of names on the side and, and, and hopefully some of you will ask questions and we'll be able to interact later in the session that way. But in, in terms of, of my experience or, or my stuttering story, uh, I, I began to stutter when I was very young. I, uh, I was so young that I was more aware of how older people were reacting to my speech rather than being aware of anything wrong with my speech at, at, at that point. So my first awareness of stuttering was more the expression of concerned elders. And, and it, uh, uh, only gradually did, did I become aware that my, when I was six or seven, that my speech was uh, continually getting stuck. Um, uh, I, after a few years, um, my parents um, uh, took me to speech therapy, and then I was very lucky in that um, I was recommended to um, a, a, an extremely innovative uh, course for children who stutter that was being led by the uh, Farringdon Health um, Centre. And it was the unit that would become the Michael Palin Centre for uh, Stammering uh, Children, which is now a, a world famous uh, in, in institution. What they were pioneering in the 80s, and this was 1987, I was one of the first cohorts of children to come through, was a, a holistic view of stuttering where they would, it was an intensive two week course where they would uh, uh, analyze a child's speech and give you some techniques for managing your stutter. But very importantly, they insisted the entire family was uh, there every day through, throughout this time. And essentially, while the children were being um, given speech therapy in one room, the children's families were, were then uh, essentially doing a form of kind of family therapy uh, in, in rooms nearby, looking at the, the dynamic going on in uh, people's families. So it was very, very pro uh, progressive. Um, uh, and, and that had a, a hugely positive effect on, on my speech. I, I found that after uh, the time uh, at the Farringdon Health Centre, by this point, I was sort of over 10 years old. I was largely able to kind of conceal my stutter through some of the, the techniques I'd been taught, uh, one of which was um, stammering modification therapy, which was taught to us kids as smooth speech, which was about slowing your speech down and softening through consonants. But the flip side of this was over my teenage years, because I found I could generally conceal my, my stutter, um, I, be I became what's called an, an, an interiorized uh, stutterer. And it meant that I was uh, constantly analyzing my speech in the moment of speaking, avoiding difficult words, uh, difficult sentences, difficult sounds. It meant my speech became rather sort of strange and baroque and circumlocutious. Um, I was avoiding situations in which I might stutter. So I was avoiding uh, I, I used to sort of love doing school plays or, uh, and then I, I stopped myself doing any of that. I stopped myself doing any of the kind of activities where you find yourself performing or talking to a group of people. And then uh, through my sort of adult years, as I got into my 20s, I, find, I, I found myself building a career for, for, for myself based on the things 
the sorts of things where I thought I wasn't going to need to talk in public. <laughs> so without realising it, the process of managing my stutter had ended up being the sort of dark star at the centre of my life, determining everything I, everything I did. And I was terrified of being discovered as a person who, who stutters. Um, what happened next was that in my early 30s, I think from having pent it up so much, it suddenly became very difficult for, for me to hide it. And I found myself uh, at, at work and uh, at home and with loved ones and work colleagues uh, stuttering a lot more. And um, it was at that point that I signed up for this City Lit course um, on interiorized <coughs> stuttering, which was set up by Carolyn Cheeseman, who's uh, here um, today. And it's uh, because of that, that I'm very glad to be here today talking with City Lit because that course really did change my life. And in the book, I really begin the book and I end the book by talking about this course as a Damascene moment uh, uh, when I suddenly saw my life in a completely different way. Um, now, it was 11, 12 years ago, and when writing the book, I went back to my diary to, to try and remember the course as I had it in my head. And I, I may get a few details wrong. I, I remember talking to Carolyn about it last year and the timing of when different things happened in the course, my brain and memory had sort of uh, kind of compressed. But what the City Lit course for interiorized stuttering did, the two things I, I remember very distinctively, were, was that first, it felt to me the first night almost like an AA meeting. There was a number of adults sitting around a, a circle. And as we began to introduce ourselves, it became clear that all of us were people who were kind of constructing our lives around concealing our, our stutter. And we were talking about it uh, almost for the first time. I was very struck somebody else on the course uh, said that not even his girlfriend knew he, he stuttered. Now, my girlfriend at the time did because I stuttered a lot at home, but I, I, I was really struck at the, the lengths to which we were collectively going to hide the fact that we were people who stutter. The next thing I remember was the course was begun by the therapist running the course uh, on, on, on that day saying, we're not going to be able to cure your stutter, but what we can do is change the way you think about it. And it was it was one of those moments where there was a sort of palpable disappointment in the room because everyone there wanted a quick fix, a quick fix that we could keep secret, no one would ever know about, and we would leave the room fluent speakers. And uh, so in, in that immediate moment, that was disappointing, but that, that idea of changing the way we think about our stutter was of course the most important thing uh, that, that we should be doing. And what I realized at, at that point was that I was then about 33 years old and I, I realized I'd spent my entire life worrying on a daily basis and nightly basis because it would keep me up often, worrying about my stutter. But I, I, I never really thought about it. And by that, I mean, I was very good at fretting about it, but I'd never actually bothered to try and find out what the kind of scientific truths were about stuttering. And at, at that time, I, I couldn't really tell you whether stuttering was a psychological or a neurological uh, function. I couldn't tell you anything about the history of how it's been treated or the impact it's had on our, our, our culture because I was too busy trying to hide from it. And, and that was what City Lit, did for me was that it started me really wanting to go on a journey of discovery about stuttering. The final thing uh, that, that happened on that course uh, was um, it, uh, it, it got us practicing something called voluntary stuttering. And voluntary stuttering, uh, for those of you who, who, who don't have stutters or, or don't know, is a technique where you deliberately stutter and you, in your working life, in your daily life, you start to introduce what are effectively fate moments of stuttering. And you do it so that you start to feel a kind of control over your speech and, and it's very empowering. And you do it as well, not breaking eye contact so that you're looking at the person you're speaking to because when you stutter, you tend to look away. And that for me as well, uh, 
was a very empowering moment because for the first time in my life, I was looking at people in the eye when I stuttered and I felt almost like I was looking at myself for the first time or, 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 or at least the version of myself that was defined my, by my experience as a person who, who stutters. And, and so that was what triggered the book in, in that I thought, I need to find out more about what this condition is that I've spent my life thinking about and dealing with. Uh, and I need to find out more about it and come to my own view about what it means to be a person who, who stutters. So the book, which essentially was 10 years <laughs> work while doing a day job from, from that point, emerged from that city lit experience. I'll stop there, Mark, because I've answered no that, 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 it opens so many questions Jonty. i mean can i just towards the end of the book you um talk about that um that little that kind of going over to holborn station do you want to tell everybody that story because i think it's actually quite intriguing in terms of, of what you've just described yes it was one of the most difficult things i've done in my life and i think it was for everyone on the course and when i spoke to to carolyn about this two years ago i remembered us almost doing it on the first night and carolyn said oh no 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 <laughs> you know we, we took weeks and weeks to build up to that moment um but but essentially what we had to do was go out in pairs and find a, pl a, a public place near to City Lit, which isn't difficult because it's right in the heart of Hoban, and, um, and stop somebody passing by on the street and, do a, and deliberately stutter when asking them a question. So me and my partner went to um, Hoban Station and I, I, I've never been so nervous in my life because it was, I was confronting everything I've spent my life catastrophizing about and fearing, but I stopped a passerby and it sounds very simple now and very untraumatic, but I can tell you it was, but I stopped somebody passing by and I said, excuse me, can you tell me the way to Covent Garden? Uh, and I faked a stutter, although interestingly, when I start a fake stutter, it ends, I end up actually blocking as I did then. Uh, and then, but you look at them while doing it. And, and of course, what happens is that person says, oh, it's just down that way and walks on. And, you know, they don't think twice about it. But it was, um, that was, and, and we just had to do that quite a few times. And effectively, we became desensitized to, to the experience of, of blocking. And it was, it, I, I describe it almost as a form of exposure therapy, and it's one that was very, very effective for me, at least. I mean, the other piece towards the end is, is you talk about your family quite a lot during the course of the book, etc. But then um, you talk about Constance, your wife. And, and it wasn't until I was going back to the, the contents of the book at the beginning of the book that I saw the dedication. And... Um, most people, if you're like me, that you don't read dedications or they're obviously meant for the person they're dedicated to, etc. But it actually really um, hit home. And it says, for Constance, love at first stutter. So, you know, talk about your relationship, talk about, with, with, obviously without any too much detail in case you're embarrassed, but um, talk, talk about the Constance element. Well, I met my... I met Constance, my wife to be, very shortly after the City Lit course. I think I may still have been doing it. It was around the same time. So I was really in, in, in a different frame of mind about stuttering. I was very curious about it. I wasn't, I, I wasn't ashamed of it anymore. I was having a bit, I, I, I was suddenly in a very different relationship. It was something I was intellectually curious about rather than emotionally ashamed of. Um, and at that point, by bizarre coincidence, a mutual friend introduced me to uh, a woman called Constance. And when we met, she said, I said, hello, I'm Jonty. And she said, hello, I'm Constance. And, <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, I, um, uh, and I, I mean, I fell in love in the first few minutes. I believe in love at first sight, or at least I didn't, but then did. And I always joke with her, I don't know if it was love at first sight or love at first stutter, because certainly the idea of being in a relationship with a person who had experience of stuttering 
I think it's a sort of thing I might have avoided 10 years be before because I, that was how I felt about stuttering. I didn't want to know anything about other people who stutter really. It was just my sort of, I felt it was my dirty secret, but uh, that there was something about the timing that it was just a kind of absolute connection and uh, the fir our first year of going out, our first two years of going out, we were both uh, at a stage in our careers where we were having to do a lot of kind of public speaking for the first time and uh, it was a very bonding experience for us and kind of our, our relationship was partly forged through this because we were both terrified and we would rehearse these sort of you know speeches or presentations we were having to do we would rehearse them endlessly to one another um uh to so uh because we were so nervous uh about sort of stuttering or um so so yeah it was these these things are all conflated in, in my mind at a certain time but um you've mentioned career and and obviously director of arts at the bbc is is something that we all go wow that's that's very impressive and tell us about the job. Um, tell us what it entails just in terms of the job description and tell us your interaction with it. You've mentioned kind of having to do quite a lot of public speaking. You know, talk about the job and then talk about the job and having a stutter. Yeah, I was, uh, I was, my inclinations when I was young about what I wanted to be when I grew up I was very interested in different types of performance, whether it was acting or uh, uh, musical performance, or uh, and I but 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 I was censoring I I was censoring my career possibilities because I I, I thought it would be impossible for me to do something where I would be, you know, talking to people. I thought you know I, I couldn't be a teacher, I couldn't be a lawyer, I couldn't. There was a whole range of things I felt I I, I couldn't do. Interestingly, I, I got very drawn to uh, documentary making and broadcast, and uh, and and I be I went and studied cinematography because I, I wanted a technical skill I could hide behind, much like the way Lewis Carroll, who was a person who stuttered, hid behind his camera. He was a, a photographer as well as a writer, and would in social situations used his camera as a kind of device to uh, uh, to sort of hide behind. And so I, I came into documentaries because I, I liked the kind of behind the scenes technicality of it. And I also found that through doing that and then becoming a documentary director or program director, I was often working with presenters uh, who were kind of gloriously fluent in my understanding. And so I sort of, I feel that I became a, a linguistic groupie but without even knowing it I was sort of my career was sort of built around enabling sort of incredibly fluent speakers who, who I had this kind of linguistic crush on essentially um, but weirdly what happened was that uh, I, I, I was a director of arts documentaries for the BBC and then ended up becoming the BBC's director of arts not realizing that a huge part of that job was a public facing one and so without intending to by my mid 30s about 10 years ago I was suddenly in a, a job where I was having to do a lot of uh, <laughs> both public speaking or speaking to journalists or present um, you, you know talking to large uh, meeting rooms and, and and so public speaking became a very kind of central part of what I was uh, what I was doing. Um, in terms of what the job entails, I mean, I'm actually leaving in, uh, in, in uh, three weeks, so I'm the outgoing director of arts at, at the BBC. But for the last seven years, I've been responsible for the BBC's arts and, uh, and cultural um, programming. Um, yeah. The, the interesting part right at the beginning of the book is for most people in the last decade or so, if they think about if they think about stuttering at all, if they're not directly having the issue, or whether they have somebody in the family, is they think about the King's Speech, and it's um, very much a romanticised, very kind of uplifting film. Um, now you tell the story of the King's Speech in a slightly different way, um, and. Um, I was just wondering if you wanted to relate some of the other versions of, of, of George VI's 
particular issues that he had and, and how it wasn't always as well received? Yes, and I, I mean, the first thing to say is that when I was beginning this journey uh, after doing the City Lit course and trying to find out about stuttering, the first thing I became aware of was just how much misinformation there is about stuttering. It's an incredibly misunderstood condition. And I think one of the reasons for that, uh, and there are many, but, but one of the reasons uh, is because it is an enigma still. It's still not definitely known what stuttering is. It's, it's, it's nowadays uh, fairly firmly thought to be a neurological condition, but, but actually it has so many kind of variables and uncertainties that it just leaves, it, historically it's left a void for people to just kind of chuck in sort of theories. And, um, and so the, for me, it was important to try and get to the heart of this misunderstanding and try and work out what was really true and what wasn't. Now, one of the things that contributes to that misunderstanding is the, the stories that get told about stuttering and people who stutter. And one of the most famous, of course, is the, uh, the uh, King George VI uh, and his stutter, which became the, the subject of a very good film called The King's Speech, which a lot of us would have seen. Um, but I thought that was an interesting place to start because in, in terms of research, because my understanding of George VI's stutter was basically what I saw in that film. And in that film, because it's Hollywood, it, it tells a redemptive story of, of a hero who has an obstacle in their life, which is that speech. And through the support of their wonderful wife and a therapist who cares about them, uh, King George VI effectively overcomes overcomes his his obstacle. He still has a bit of a stutter, but the film ends with him giving a, a rousing and uh, and inspiring speech. That was the starting point, and I then began to read uh, biographies of George the VI and also listen to his speeches, which uh, a lot of them are available online. And what became apparent to me fairly quickly was that George VI never overcame his stutter. And um, uh, he, I mean, all through his life, whenever he gave speeches, you can, you can hear him desperately trying not to stutter to the point that they become quite painful to, to listen to. And so I began to ask a, a different question, which wasn't, did George VI overcome his stutter? because the answer was he never did. But the question became for me, why did it matter so much that George VI had a stutter? And when you listen to his speeches, um, all you can hear is somebody desperately, desperately trying not to stutter to the point that what he's saying becomes stripped of any emotional meaning. He, um, he, he developed a technique that his therapist called Three Word Breaks where you speak in packets of three words, you get three words out, pause, do the next three words, and so on. And it beca I became fascinated about why people would rather hear somebody speaking that way, where you, you cannot really deliver any meaning. If I, I mean, speech needs a degree of kind of uh, spontaneity and emotional connection for it to have impact. And why would it, so why would George rather speak that way than speak as he, actually spoke, which was a person capable of making, you know, great sense, having great emotional connection, but who just stuttered a bit. And I think that's interesting on multiple levels, because it's about society's view of what is fluent and what is disfluent, but also just, um, and you mentioned this in the book, um, about how uh, the media and movies in Hollywood and also television series have kind of three almost stereotypes of stuttering people. They they very rarely have somebody who just happens to have a stutter. The stutter is a thing. So, you know, my generation grew up with open all hours with Ronnie Barker making great fun of, uh, you know, having a stutter. We obviously have Fish Called Wanda with Michael Palin. But then we also have the, 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 the and there was a brilliant lecture at City Lit about four or five years ago by an American um, speech therapy specialist talking about, how often um, Hollywood depicts somebody with a stutter as evil. Um, I think of Primal Fear, the Ed Norton character there, but there are many examples of it. Um, talk a bit, obviously you're, you're in the media, so, so your profession doesn't necessarily do any favours to, to stutterers. 
No, I mean, the reality of it is, and it takes quite a while to find this out, is there is no psychological significance per se to, to stuttering itself, right? People are born with it. There seems to be a genetic element and it's a difference in, in the wiring of the brain that means that some people struggle with their speech and stutter. Um, and yet you would never guess that from the way it's portrayed in the media. What is true is that you can be born with stuttering. Uh, you, you have this slightly different wiring in the brain, but through observing the way people react to you, you develop feelings of shame. And so it does develop a psychological dimension. But for the, the, the prosaic truth is that there is no personality type uh, for, for people who stutter. They're not more neurotic. They're not angry people. Um, uh, and I think one of the things that's given that s suggestion is media portrayal, because, you know, if, if you're if you're in the entertainment business and you're telling stories, stuttering is a very useful device. You can use it to show that a character is unreliable, a bit sinister. You can use it for great comic effect, as they did in A Fish Called Wonder and uh, uh, Open All Hours. And you can use it as a device to show a hero who's overcome some sort of obstacle, whether that's George VI in the King's Speech or Simon in Bridgerton, to take a more um, contemporary example. One of the reasons for this, partly, is how uh, psychoanalysis in the early years of the 20th century uh, interpreted uh, stuttering. And obviously that's not the case anymore, but there is a pretty distressing legacy of the way um, stuttering was viewed through psychoanalysis, which became mainstreamed. And the ultimate, I, I think one classic example of that is Billy in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, if you re remember the book or the film. Uh, Billy is a deeply neurotic uh, character. He's uh, with a sort of mother fixation and all this is revealed through his, uh, his stutter. So it's become incredibly kind of in, in, instrumentalized and in a way that has um, entered mainstream perception. You, you know, one of the things I mention in my book is, uh, you know, 12 years ago, going on a date with uh, a woman who, and uh, as I was stuttering when talking, she said, uh, uh, are you a very angry person? And I was like, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not more angry than anyone else. Um, so, so yes, there is uh, the uh, media and cultural portrayal of stuttering has been very, very unhelpful. And the other thing as well is that often people who stutter get so sort of brainwashed by that themselves that they don't help because they end up contributing to that. Um, John Updike, the American novelist, you know, wrote a, uh, an essay about his stutter in which he says, I stutter most when I'm being deceitful. Um, so when you get things like that, it's incredibly unhelpful as well, because it seems to be a person who stutters uh, reinforcing that, that, that message. But no, th there is nothing inherent in stuttering which implies neurosis or anger or evil or deceit at all. It's just cultural baggage, and it's that cultural baggage that we have to dismantle. Um, you broadly define disfluency, which I think is very interesting. And, and you talk about the different challenges, different conditions have caused. And um, I found it, I, I must admit, I found that part of the book quite moving and quite difficult. Um, 20 years ago, my father died of uh, motor neurons disease. And um, I kind of, you're, it's interesting how you look back, you say about going back to diaries and stuff like that, but I remember my dad's physical decline. I remember the, the very end, um, which was awful, absolutely awful. Um, but I'd forgotten how much he was robbed of his speech. So the Malcolmsons, as most of my colleagues will tell you, are, are, are get sort of talkative to, to say the least. Um, and dad had been an engineer and after he'd retired had become a college lecturer. So um, immediately he started exhibiting problems. He, he um, left his job and he, his world kind of compacted on him. And um, he stopped kind of seeing people because he was embarrassed about his speech. And a lot of that, you talk about your cousin Gilly who has MND um, and you talk about a number of other conditions. And 
broadly talking about the, the, the family of conditions around disfluency, I thought was really interesting as opposed to kind of going, there's stammerers, there's people with aphasia, there's this, that. So talk about why you've kind of gone quite broad as opposed to making the book particularly around kind of stammering. Yeah, it's partly for political and activist reasons. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll explain why, but I, um, when you have a speech disorder, you're made to feel like you're part of a very small minority. Uh, and so I only ever encountered other people who stutter through uh, environments like the Michael Palin Center or, or City Lit. It seemed to me a very, very rare condition. And yet you would be told there's a kind of famous statistic, which is roughly 1% of the world population uh, uh, stutters. But you never felt like you were meeting that 1%. And I think it's because a lot of people who stutter develop kind of quite secretive behavior, I certainly did. And, and I, I realized retrospectively that uh, there were moments in my life where I had encountered other people who stutter, but like me, they were, they were, they were making a secret of it. Um, um, and uh, there's Irving Goffman, the sociologist in his book on stigma from the 1960s, he, he, he identifies this, he says, he says one of the extraordinary things is that there's all sorts of conditions where, where people organize and, and where there's a lot of activism, but for some reason, people who have defects of speech seem to be very reluctant to organize, which I, I thought was an interesting statement. I guess on one hand, it's sort of obvious that if, you, if you're a person who struggles to speak, that doesn't lend itself very well to speaking to other people um, uh, about it. So. Um, I also, through, as I was writing the book and beginning to talk to people about it, I was astonished at how many people would say, oh, I'm a person who stutters. I'm an interiorized stutterer. The entire reason why I'm doing the job I'm doing is because I stutter. And, I, and there are people who wouldn't have told me that otherwise. So I really became aware suddenly of, of there really are probably 1% of the population who stutter. And it's only when you start talking to them that, that you start to find out that's the case. I then became very, very interested there. I, I, I thought if I've been ignoring other people who stutter all my life, despite being a person who stutters, are there other sorts of speech conditions which I ought to be kind of learning about? So I began talking to other people that I knew who had different uh, speech conditions uh, and, and I became particularly interested in aphasia, which is um, the, the, the uh, uh, struggling to kind of recall speech that happens off most frequently after a stroke. I became interested in the um, uh, the vocal ticking of Tourette syndrome. I became interested in dysarthria, which is the kind of speech we associate with people who have cerebral palsy or motor neurone disorder. And from talking to people with those conditions, yes, they're very different conditions and in medical terms, they're entirely separate things and it's right and proper they should be looked at you know separately H however what came up through all my conversations was certain themes were common across them all which is whether people had vocal tics or dysarthria or aphasia or stuttering they felt that they were outsiders to mainstream use of speech and that they felt their relationship with language was fundamentally different to, to how it is for a fluent mainstream. For people who have a speech disorder, speech is, is not a tool of commu communication, or at least it partly is. It's also a kind of instrument of fear and shame, and, and, and that puts you into a very different relationship with speech. Um, so I, I began for kind of political and activist reasons to, 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 to sort of say, why don't people who stutter talk to more people who stutter? Why don't people who stutter talk to people with aphasia or have Tourette syndrome? If all of us are dealing with the same sort of discrimination, and, and uh, to an extent we are, because you know, if you're looking at job applications, Many job applications say the person who gets this job will be a fluent and effective communicator. So it doesn't matter if you're a person who stutters or a person with dysarthria or aphasia, you are ruled out from that job. So uh, I began to think, what would happen if we organized more? What would happen if we began talking more? 
And the, the reason why I said at the start, this comes down to a sort of activist reasons, is that there's a famous, you know, it's famously said that to change society, to change mainstream perception, you need three and a half percent of the population to, to become committed to a cause. Now, the, the problem about the one percent of the population who stutters is that that's not three and a half percent. So how do you get from one percent to three and a half percent? And that's why in the book I advocate uh, starting to connect more with different types of uh, uh, different communities um, of, of people who struggle with speech and language in different ways. And, and for me, it's not just about speech disorders. I was talking to people with dyslexia as well. And Mark, I know that's a part of your life. Uh, so, so all those people who, who, who feel that the way they use language is at odds with the way a, a, a sort of um, uh, neurotypical mainstream expects them to. I think that you're right. I think the phrase you use quite a lot is, is wiring, which is something I also talk about, which is to say my wiring's just different. So I have various challenges that make me not good at certain things. So I'm very, you know, part of the reason I said earlier, I don't like people writing big long things in the chat boxes because I really struggle to be able to read them and think and speak at the same time. But I do think, and this goes to the next point around, and pride and, and stammering pride and, and fluency pride is, is that different wiring, whilst in some ways puts you at a disadvantage, it also puts you at a huge advantage in other ways. And, and there's a great part of the book, there's a very substantial part of the book that actually talks about the disfluent and, and, and how they've contributed to society, how thinking differently, being wired differently is a positive and society needs to see the positives as well as the challenges. So do you wanna talk a little bit about that, John T? Because I think it's, it's incredibly insightful and, and quite surprising to a lot of us. They're like, wow, I never knew. Yeah, so my fundamental belief is that <laughs> Uh, and it took me a while to get there. But my belief is that stuttering isn't a disorder. It's simply a form of vocal and linguistic diversity that enriches our, enriches our culture and uh, society in different ways. It's very hard to get to that place of thinking because growing up, the words that are used to, to describe stuttering tend to be formed by taking uh, a positive word and putting a negative prefix on it. So disfluency, disorder, um, impediment. So it's very hard to unbrainwash yourself um, to, to, to even begin to argue that, that, that there are productive qualities that come with stuttering and other types of speech um, disorder. That's not to say that, that the experience of a speech disorder can, uh, can be very painful and emotionally painful and even physically painful. That, that's, that's all there and there's no use denying that because it's very much a part of people's lives. However, what we can also do is start to look at the very productive and creative elements that often come with these conditions as well. So to take a, a classic example, in the school classroom, where there's a kid who stutters, who seems unable to contribute to class discussion because they have, um, they have a, a, a very pronounced stutter, the perception of that classroom will, the perception of that classroom will be that that individual has a diminished capability for speech and language. Now, the reverse is true, because if you're a person who stutters, you uh, very quickly develop all sorts of linguistic techniques for managing your stutter. One of the things you do is learn a huge vocabulary because you, you need uh, uh, any number of words to deploy at different moments. Um, sociologists have uh, described how people who stutter develop a kind of three-dimensionality in their, in, in, in their linguistic skills because as they're speaking, they're often running a kind of parallel scout, uh, scouting kind of... Um, mission in their brain, searching ahead for the words they're going to say and shifting in replacements as they go along. And that certainly uh, captures the way I feel about it. So often people who stutter have, have uh, are actually a lot more linguistically versatile, even if that's not being seen by people around them. 
The other thing I, I became very interested in, uh, b because it's my uh, working life, which is the arts and culture, was I, I was always struck when growing up that um, when you did speech therapy, you would be sort of told of some of the extraordinary individuals who uh, stuttered. And they were often extraordinarily creative people to the point where I thought, blimey, it sounds like more than 1% of the creative community stutters. You know, it's extraordinary writers like Lewis Carroll and Henry James uh, and Dambuzo uh, Marachera, the uh, Zimbabwean writer. It's musicians like John Lee Hooker and B.B. King uh, and Ed Sheeran. It's any number of actors and performers. So I became very interested in the creative potential of stuttering and why so many people who stutter become exceptional writers and performers and artists um, as well. And for me, starting to describe those productive or creative qualities uh, uh, that, that come with stuttering and other speech disorders was important because it starts to challenge the unanimous, the singularly negative uh, uh, mainstream perception of these conditions. It, it, it introduces another side, which is both productive and creative. And I think it goes back to, you go back to activism and advocacy, is that um, I know the very profound effect for a lot of people who stammer um, around Ed Balls being open about the fact that he was a very senior politician and he had that particular challenge, but he also has what is becoming increasingly a myriad of talents from cooking to dancing. Um, and that is something that I think surprised a lot of people that you could do that and at the same time be a successful public speaker. Um, but in addition, you've got, um, you talk, tell the story of Nye Bevan. And um, that for me was quite surprising. I never knew that. And the idea that he is made such a profound change to British society through the National Health Service and his trade union advocacy, but he did it despite or maybe because of his disfluency issues. So I think that's that's really important. And the book really does highlight those different cases. One thing which you touch on very briefly, because obviously it's a story that's kind of come up since you've been writing the majority of the book, is um, Joe Biden. And Joe Biden has been quite open about his stutter, but at the same time is of quite old school where he talks about, I used to have a stutter. Um, so, so help me a little bit about having high profile people come out and be open about it, but at the same time, is, can that be a positive and a negative? Is, is Joe Biden being covered of, as a stutterer a good thing compared with say the hyperfluency of say Obama? Yeah, and before I get to Biden, uh, I want to say that over, over the last several years, very excitingly, a stammering pride movement has been developing in both the United States and here in the UK. And actually City Lit has been one of the kind of um, theoretical and sort of intellectual uh, hotbeds for, for that. A, a lot of the people involved in that movement have been connected to, to uh, City Lit. And, and it's emerged particularly over the last five years, which is uh, people uh, people who stutter beginning to um, to uh, uh, stand up to to that discrimination and look at their experience and their speech through the lens of neurodiversity. And so the book I've done is just one of those kind of flowers in what needs to be a thousand flowers blooming. I th I think one of the really important things that has both resulted in and also been inspired by it, it, it seems to be happening symbiotically, is high profile people who stutter starting to come out about their experiences over the last 10 years. And I think uh, Ed Balls, who's here, is a, a very significant one of those. It's, uh, I mean, a, a clip that drives me mad is a clip from eight years ago, I think, where Ed Balls is speaking in Parliament and he's being laughed at because he's blocking on a word. Um, and I, I, I think for Ed Balls to, to, to actually sort of come out and say, uh, and, and say I'm a person who stutters and that sort of treatment is unacceptable, is, is, is very significant in the political sphere. You also have, have a lot more actors and performers uh, doing it than you did in the past. You get, um, 
There are actors like Emily Blunt who are at the absolute peak of their career at the heart of a Hollywood kind of PR machine. I'm not sure an Emily Blunt 30 or 40 years ago would have spoken so openly about her experience of stuttering in the way she is doing, doing now. Um, you have Ed Sheeran doing it and Kendrick Lamar, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, one incredibly important person in this has been Joe Biden, who, who over the last decade has spoken a lot about his, um, his, his experience of, of, of uh, stuttering and been a hugely important figure for uh, challenging that mainstream discrimination. There is a lot of talk in the stuttering community, though, about one aspect of Biden's narrative, which is Biden uh, nearly always talks about stuttering in the past tense. And he talks about it as, a, as, as an obstacle overcome, which ties in quite neatly with that narrative of a presidential candidate who's overcome adversity to be the person they are now. And so while uh, everyone's very excited about Biden talking about stuttering, there's also been a bit of why won't he talk about it more as being a continuing part of his life. And if you look at his speeches closely, uh, anyone who has an interiorized stutter like me can see quite regular moments where he's coming up against a block and then replacing it with a different word or stepping aside. And so there's a slight feeling of, you know, should he be more, should he be talking more about this being something he's still, that is still a part of his life, even if not quite to the same extent it used to be. And do you think that partly is a generational thing of, you know, he is not young, particularly he grew up in a certain generation where covering it up was probably the way, that, as you say, actors and people who now will talk about it. I was surprised actually Marilyn Monroe, I never realized had a stutter. Um, is, that, um, is that a generational thing? And you see each generation, you almost think our children's generation might be more, you, you talk about more tolerance at school because obviously children can be very unkind um, and pick on points of difference. So do you see this kind of strata of generations and hopefully as change starts to go through that the next generations will be more opening, more accepting and more inclusive? Definitely, I think that's definitely the trajectory at, at the moment. I mean, interestingly, uh, Marilyn Monroe's distinctive voice, which everyone assumes was a sort of sexy voice she put on, uh, there's also a sort of theory that it was the way she managed her stutter, because in some ways it's not dissimilar to stuttering modification therapy, uh, that very soft, slow, uh, slow voice. Um, but to come to answer your question, yes, I think there's definitely a generational thing. And, and that's why I don't think Biden is necessarily deliberately not acknowledging the role of stuttering in his life. I think it's just second nature. I think he grew up as part of a generation where you you do your best to overcome it and you hide it and you don't talk about it. And I was definitely struck from writing the book, talking to younger people, that a, a younger generation is much more, although it's a very difficult thing for them, they're much more willing to kind of talk about it. Um, uh, and I think it's partly because, you know, I was, you know, I, I was 12 years old when the Stutter app was, was in the top 10, you, you know, which was, one of the most appalling pieces of disability discrimination, uh, you, you know, uh, getting to the top 10 of the single charts, you know, when you had open all hours on and a fish called Wander on, you know, th the last thing you wanted as a 12 year old kid in 1988 was for anyone to know you're a person who stutters. Um, and, uh, and, and I think having these role models like Kendrick Lamar um, uh, and Biden being so open about uh, their experience of stuttering is definitely helping a kind of new generation to, 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 to be more open about it. So I think that's hugely significant because when that happens, it starts to be destigmatized and destigmatizing things like stuttering is, is to solve one half of the problem. Brilliant. As we're drawing to an end, I, I just like from individuals, employers, you know, people who are working with colleagues, friends, family. What are the kind of key things that, you know, as, as allies or advocates or supporters, we should be doing better? It's about inclusivity. And by that, I mean, uh, in, when, 
we encounter people who struggle with speech in some way without even realizing it we tend to exclude them uh it may be if you're in a room and there's somebody who um has cerebral palsy or who has a very pronounced stutter you you find yourself avoiding talking to them because it's going to be too difficult um uh, so it goes down very simply to to, to that sort of level uh it, it, it certainly uh, needs to be picked up by HR departments in, in companies. The fact that in 2021, it's still a regular occurrence that in job descriptions, you see those words, effective and fluent communicator as necessary is, is, is sort of shocking really. Uh, so everything is about inclusivity. It's about, uh, it, it's about not avoiding or excluding people who struggle with speech. Uh, in all the different ways one uh, sort of one does that, whether that's the structural level about excluding them from employment down to that kind of interpersonal in in the pub level. Um, and uh, yeah. That's brilliant. Um, everybody, this is just such a tremendous book for fluent, disfluent, whoever it might be, it challenges your assumptions. It makes you think in a very, very different way. And I think John T has done a, a huge service um, to public as a whole. I hope this book is tremendously successful. Um, we will do our best to promote it as a college. Um, thank you hugely for your kind words about my colleagues at City Lit. They do an amazing job in the speech therapy area and I know support many hundreds of people over the years um, and, and we're really hoping that we can do more of that. Um, advocacy like you're encouraging is obviously a key part to this so we will do our bit um, John T, thank you for spending the last hour with us. It has absolutely been tremendous. I've still got about half a page of questions because there's so much in the book that makes you think about things. So I'm actually leaving that as a teaser for everybody who's in the audience is you'll get to um, read the book, hopefully. Um, John T, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody who joined us. And we'll send out details of the book to everybody just to make sure that you have that. Um, Take care, John T. Thank you, everybody, for joining. And um, please stay part of the City Lit community. All right. Thank you all.